Hi, I'm Mike Steven, and this is another episode of Gear Up. Today we're going to talk about something controversial, electric bikes. So the controversial part doesn't usually happen on the commuter side of things. It happens when you go into the trails with these things. We'll get to the trail part later. First, we're going to talk about more the commuter around town, maybe uh, replacing a vehicle in your house. Um, a lot of people are really interested in these things because, hey, it's fun to ride a bike, and it's even funner if it can save you some money at the gas pumps. So the neat thing about these guys is that they can be plugged directly into your wall to recharge them. So when you take it home or when you bring it to work, you can plug it directly into the wall, it'll charge the battery. Which brings me to the point of, hey, how far do these bikes go? On average, they're in around a 100 kilometer range. Um, that is dependent on how heavy the rider is, how much the rider is assisting the bicycle, uh, whether there's hills or not. So that is a loose calculation, but it is a lot bigger distance than most people think. I'm a fairly heavy guy. I've ridden to Kimberley and back with two children on the bike, one on a trailer bike, one on the handlebars, and I was able to have lunch at the pedal and tap, cruise back, and everything was good. I ran out just as I got home, so that's 60-ish kilometers, something like that, with a heavy load. So the range is very good on these things. So you're gonna run into all sorts of different styles of electric bikes. One thing that I recommend is on electric bikes, go for quality. When you combine mother nature with electronics, quality is worth it. Because when you're expecting this bike to get you to work on time, when you're expecting those types of things, the good quality units will stand up to the rain, the muck, day in, day out, keep you riding. Next thing up to bat, you're gonna have to make some decisions. Do you wanna get a whole bike like this guy right here? This is what's called a center drive, which means the motor is in the center of the bike. It's actually the most efficient system out there right now is the center drives. Center drive drives your pedals and gives you an assistance through that. The other components of the bike are the battery pack and your display unit and throttle. So that's what makes this an electric bike is those components there. There's kind of a neat option that if you say, hey, I've already got a really nice bike in my garage, I'd just like to turn it into an electric bike. That's where we get into these systems that you see to my right. So you've got your battery pack right here, bolts on just like a pannier. It gives you the same ability to plug into your wall, the same everything. The one thing about these systems is they're not quite as clean how they go onto the bike, but they're pretty darn good. Um, next component. is your motor. The motor is actually in the rear wheel of the bike. So you just take off your rear wheel, replace it with this guy, and that is now your drive. So the motor is the drive versus on this bike, the bottom bracket being the drive. The other pieces of the system are the controller and the display. So that'll mount to your handlebars. This guy gives you more power, less power, and this fancy red button is the throttle. So this bike has the option, or this system has the option of hitting the throttle once you're moving and you don't even have to pedal, so if you just wanna go. Most bikes are set up so that you can, so that they will assist you. So assisting you means that, it's kinda like the wind at your back, it's like you, only faster. So, and you can choose different levels of assistance. Most of them are eco, is about a 20% assist. So when you pick up an electric bike, you're gonna go, man, these things are about 20 pounds heavier than a standard bike. You're correct. But even at 20% or, or eco mode, the bike is faster and easier to ride than that lighter bike. Then you've got uh, like a sport mode, and then you've got what's called a turbo mode. So you've got those three different modes, depending on how much effort you wanna put into the bike. I find for the most part, I don't even like the turbo mode that much. I like the sport mode for the most part. Uh, I still get a great workout. Because with these systems, with assisted systems, the harder you pedal into them, the more they feed back. So it's slightly addictive that the harder you pedal, the more power comes out of the bike. So you will find that you'll get a great workout. One of the things that'll be different though is that it's hard to go anaerobic, or it's hard to get to the point where you're starving for oxygen uh, because these things will help you enough to not go there. But you can still get a great workout on these bikes. The other place that I've seen these bikes be incredible is people with disabilities. People that just don't have the power anymore in their legs to be able to put the consistent output. Man, we've sold quite a few of these to those styles of people. And you know what, it really 
elongates their riding career. The other thing that I've seen is people that like to ride together. So you have a much faster rider and a much slower rider. Man, those two riders can ride together and have a great ride. And at the end of the ride, they'll both be tired respectively and they've gotten to ride together. Other than that, as a uh, form of uh, transportation, which we already talked about, a lot of people like the idea of riding to work, but if they have to carry something heavy home at the end of the day, or if they're just plain old tired out at the end of the day, it's nice to be outside, but they may not want to put a whole bunch of effort forth. So that's again where the, the electric uh, really comes into play. The next category, the controversial category, that's where it gets into mountain bikes. So where the controversy springs from is, are these motorbikes or are these pedal bikes? A lot of different people are going to have different opinions on this, and I'd say the biggest thing that you need to do is try one, and then you can form your own opinion. Because until you've tried it, it's kind of unfair to offer an opinion. So out on the trails, I find that these things don't have enough power. Any of the assisted models don't have enough power to tear up the trail like a motorbike would tear up the trail. So they really, they don't cause any more damage to the trail than an extremely fit mountain biker. Whereas I don't get out riding as often as I used to. So I love taking this thing out on the trails and doing some of the trails that I used to do when I was 19. I'll go out and I'll do all three or four viewpoints all in one ride. So it means more corners, more berms, more descents, more fun. So this just allows me to go out for that same hour and a half ride. I've just covered way more distance. So that's one of the positives of the, the mountain bike style. And to get to the nuts and bolts of the mountain bike style, this bike is very, very, very capable. It can go anywhere where a regular bike can go. You can take it off jumps, you can take it off drops, you can do whatever you want that is within your ability. These bikes can handle a lot or anything that the mountains can throw at them. So this style of bike isn't as much your commuter bike, it's more your play bike to go out and have fun on uh, out in the trails. This is also a center drive system, meaning that the motor is sit sitting in the center of the unit. They made this bike very, very sleek because out in the mountain trails, you don't want stuff that uh, rocks and twigs and stuff like that are gonna snag any wires. So really, the only way that you'll ever know that this is an electric bike is two places. One, that this bottom bracket area looks a little bit too big. And two, when you turn this guy on, you can see some lights on the side. That just gives you your indicator of how much battery you have left. This particular model has some incredible features. If you're gonna go ride, say, something like the Seven Summits, it's a fairly long ride. If you say, hey, I want this battery to last perfectly over the course of seven hours or a distance, you can choose that, and have 10% left at the very end of that so that I can ride to my car, you can actually set that on your phone and your phone can talk to this bicycle and it perfectly drains the battery over that seven or eight hours, whatever you set it to do, and then gives you that 10% just to make it back to your car uh, at the end of the ride. The other thing that you can do with uh, a bike like this is you can actually set how aggressively the electric motor kicks in. Because if it kicks in quite aggressively uh, while you're shifting, it gives you those crunchy, harsh shifts. So you can actually dial in how aggressive the motor engages. You can also uh, adjust those settings like Eco, Sport, and Turbo. So there's lots of adjustability to the bike. You can have it so it's just helping you out a little bit, enough to take care of the weight plus maybe the wind at your back, uh, all the way up to the point where really you're not going to work overly hard the entire time. That day at work where you're really tired and you just want some fresh air but still get home, it can do that as well. So electric bikes are incredibly versatile. I think that they're opening doors for lots of people to ride together, so I'm pretty excited about them. The ones that I'm not excited about are the ones that have a lot of power in them. The ones that basically aren't as legal in Canada. They're, they're, they're not legal in Canada. They go above the speed limits. Anything that Canada has made legalized, I think are great bikes, and they just give the opportunity for more people to ride together. And people that maybe would have given up biking allow them to bike a little bit longer. What I've found is, realistically, an electric bike has taken time out of the seat in my car. It hasn't taken time away from my other bikes. I still love to road ride. I still love to ride a regular mountain bike with my friends. Uh, I find that the electric bike has kind of gotten me out there maybe a little bit more often and has maybe taken some of the car riding away. 
It is an emerging category. There's going to be lots changing and evolving as it continues. But I think it's an exciting one, and I think it's one definitely worth taking a look at if you're a bike enthusiast. Thanks for watching Gear Up. Hi, I'm Mike Steven, and this is another episode of Gear Up. Today we're going to talk about bike maintenance, what you should do before your ride, and what you should do after your ride. A few minutes of maintenance on your bike can make your bike ride a lot better when you're out on the trail, and when you get home, a few minutes of maintenance will actually help your bike run a lot smoother and a lot longer without you having to spend money on it. First off the bat, I'll explain. At the shop here we have these really fancy stands. They're wonderful, but they're incredibly expensive. Whereas your average consumer can buy a portable stand for a lot less. Uh, it just allows you for you to work on the bike and not have the bike flopping on you, be able to work through the gears, be able to uh, lubricate the chain. They're really quite nice. If you're an avid biker, it's one of those things that you should put on the must list. I'll show you this stand real quick. Uh, a lot of people are tight for space. So that's how small it compacts down to. You can uh, open up this knob and that's going to bring out the bike arm that's actually going to secure the bike. Tighten it down. It can be adjusted to any angle you want, so you can actually have the bike tilted at different angles depending on what you're doing on the bike. Next up to bat, I'm going to drop the legs. And you can set the stand to the specific height. I don't like working on my bike down here. I like to be standing upright when I work on my bike, so you can actually adjust the height of this stand quite tall. Next up, the support legs. Nice and wide platform so that it'll support the bike well. You clamp your seat post in this part of the bike uh, stand, and that allows you to work on a bike in a firm, secure setting. Just makes bike work a lot easier. It's not necessary. You can have your buddy hold it. You can lean it up against something. There's lots of ways you can do it, so don't let this uh, uh, deter you from bike riding. But hey, if you can get one of these, they're great. Next, we're going to get into the actual what you should do before you go for a ride. One of the most important things you should do, and one thing that people don't do near enough, is check their tire pressure. Tire pressure is what allows you to ride your bike smoothly through the trail without stopping for a flat tire. Most flats are caused by what's called a pinch flat. Pinch flats are when the tire, or the, the rim more specifically, uh, the tire bottoms out onto the rim between a rock and the rim, and it pinches the tire. How you can tell you're getting pinch flats is if you take your tube out, you pump it up, it's going to look like two holes side by side. That's a pinch flat. If there's a single hole, chances are that's debris from the trail or the road getting into your tire and that's a flat that putting up your tire pressure won't help with. Now, how do you choose your tire pressure? Too much tire pressure and what's going to happen is you're going to bounce off all the rocks and sticks and twigs. You'll roll a little bit faster on a perfectly smooth surface, but out mountain biking, it's not smooth very often at all. So recent research has proven that to run a little bit lower air pressure in your tires will make your bike ride faster, even climbing, even through the, the quick stuff. So what happens is when you reduce air pressure in the tire, the tire molds over top of the train and doesn't get shot back. That's called negative feedback. When you're riding over something and you've got higher air pressure, the tire is going to be bouncing continually off the stuff on the trail, creating negative feedback and making you slower and less controlled. If you get the correct tire pressure in there, the tires are going to absorb over top of the bumps, maintain ground control, which means that you're in control of the bike. The next thing uh, with tire pressure is, if, if, you, if you have it too low, so you've backed that down, you're getting great ground control, but you start getting pinch flats, then you got to pull it up. So for myself, I weigh about 220 pounds, and I run about 32 PSI in my back tire, and about 29 PSI in my front tire. The reason I run 29 PSI in my front tire, or the difference there, is because if you run a lower PSI in your front tire, it allows you to hook up into the corners a lot better. Your bike enters into corners and exits them much smoother. And that's just a little bit of bike maintenance to actually help your ride. So we've gone over tire pressure. Do it every time. It'll make a huge difference in your riding, and it's absolutely free. <laughs> Next up to bat, putting some lube on your chain. Putting lube on your chain is the fastest thing in the world to do. Basically, I find it easiest to shift my bike into one of the lower cogs here. 
Then take your lube, run the chain backwards, and throw some lube on it. All you need is one complete revolution of the chain, and you've got enough lube on there. Try to let it soak for two to three minutes. Uh, so one thing that some people do is they'll lube their chain at the end of the ride. So they'll clean their bike up and lube it at the end. That way it gets to soak into the chain really well. So basically, now that you've got air, lube, put, uh, you can uh, throw an Allen key on a few of the bolts to check the tightness to make sure that A, your handlebars are tight, your stem is tight. Those are two really important things. The front end of the bike, if it gets loose and something fails, that's a big problem. If the back end of the bike something fails on it, it's going to be inconvenient, but you're usually not going to crash. But it is a good idea to check your bike for tightness before you go out for a ride. A quick test I like to do, grab a hold of the main frame, grab a hold of the rear frame. You've got two different triangles here, and they're joined by this piece of suspension. If you take it and rock it back and forth, you'll feel if there's any play in there. If there's play, snug down the appropriate bolts. If you're not comfortable doing that, bring it down to your local bike shop. They'll take care of you. So now you're ready for a ride. You go out, you have a fantastic ride. Uh, when you get back, chances are your bike's going to look a little bit like this. It's going to have some mud on it. A lot of people do the worst thing you could possibly do for your bike. They bring their bike home and they pull out the garden hose or even worse, the pressure washer and start hosing down the bike or pressure washing their bike. The reason you don't want to do that is that you have bearings in here, in through your derailleur, in your bottom bracket, up in these areas, in here, down in your hubs. You've got a lot of bearings and moving parts on the bike. If you're forcing water into those areas, it's pushing the grease, which is supposed to be in there, out and forcing grit and grime into the bike to cause creaks and make your bike noisy and get rid of the lubricant on it. The best way to do it is get a bucket of warm soapy water or a product like this, spray it down on your bike and then use a bucket of warm water with a brush set. Use a bucket of warm water with a brush set and you clean everything off. You're not forcing water into any weird areas. And then yes, you can use a hose, but just lightly drizzle it off. Don't use it with a gun. Just wash off the debris, the mud, all that stuff, the soap, whatever you've been using. Um, so that will help keep the bike operating a lot smoother. Uh, I, like I say, I like to throw lube on the chain when I get home. That way it has a little bit more time to soak. So you're going to wash down your bike, clean it up, get all the mud off of it using the process that I told you. One of my good buddies, his favorite thing to do in the world is use stuff like this. It polishes your bike. Not only does it polish your bike to make it look nice, but it actually allows your bike to shed mud a lot better. If a smooth sur on a smooth surface, the mud wipes off a lot faster and easier. So you can use a polished product like this. The other thing that people really like to do is clean the drivetrain. You're always lubing the drivetrain. So to clean the drivetrain, which is your chain, your cogs, your derailleur, and your front ring, to clean that, some people will use a product like this. It's a chain cleaner. It actually just snaps right onto your chain. You put fluid in it, you back pedal, and all the little brushes in there work and clean your chain. You still have to clean your, clean your drivetrain, but as mentioned before, you can use brush tools like this. And this is a great little tool. It's a cog stack cleaner. Allows you to get in between each of the cog stacks, pull the muck and debris out with a little brush to, to kind of touch it up. So that'll clean your bike up, uh, get all the debris off of it. Then you're going to lube the chain and away you go. If you don't use that pressure washer and you don't use that hose with a uh, special sprayer on it, you're not going to drive the lube out of the parts that are important on the bikes and you'll get far less creaking and far less frustration out, on there and out there on the trail. You know what? That's all I can think of for this episode. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Mike Steven, and this is another episode of Gear Up. Today, we're going to talk about sunglasses. You know what? A lot of people wear sunglasses strictly for the fashion sense. Some people wear them for the safety. There's all sorts of different aspects to sunglasses. I'm just going to go through a few with you. Um, first off, the one that I like the most is protection. Uh, whether I be out cycling or driving my car, uh, believe it or not, your sunglass choice can actually help you. 
It's important when driving a vehicle, for example, to stay away from glass lenses. Glass lenses, if you're ever in an accident, have the potential to go into your eyes. Uh, whereas polycarbonate is another material that they can make lenses out of. It's slightly softer than glass, so it's hard to get the optics high end, but they can do this. And the benefit of polycarbonate is polycarbonate is very impact resistant. One of the companies that we sell does an impact test. They actually fire at a lens with a 12 gauge shotgun from six feet away. The pellets from the 12 gauge actually don't even penetrate the lens. They don't cause the lens to shatter. Uh, and you could actually see some of the pellets sticking through the lens. Uh, not through the lens, sorry, coming into the lens, but staying in the lens. So poly polycarbonate is incredibly resilient against impact. It's one of the reasons why the military uses them. Uh, I, I've seen some uh, a footage of, uh, of a soldier that had uh, his glasses on. You could see the line on his face where his glasses covered. Uh, uh, a roadside device went off. The shrapnel hit his face everywhere. And the only part that didn't have scratches and damage was right behind where his optics were protecting him. So uh, most of us don't need the optics to that degree. But when you are out cycling, you're out hiking, there's mud, there's bugs, there's sticks, there's all sorts of things. So protection is actually one of the things that you should think about if you are a sports-minded person uh, buying your optics. The next thing is protecting your eyes from the different types of uh, uh, light there are out there. There is good light and bad light. Uh, some of the good lights out there are blue light. Uh, blue light is something that uh, you can now buy if, if, if you work in an office job, you can buy a little blue light to have in your office. And blue light uh, has been linked uh, to uh, increasing positivity, increasing mood. So a lot of people, like I say, in office spaces are using these blue lights. Uh, sunglasses uh, now are starting to dissect the light spectrum and allow blue light in so that you still get those happy thoughts and those positive thoughts while blocking the dangerous uh, light out UVA, UVB that can actually damage you and your skin. Uh, the other thing that they've started to do by pulling apart the light spectrum is I don't know if you've ever put on a pair of dark sunglasses and gone from an extreme light situation into a darker situation. It takes your eyes time to adjust. Whereas if you uh, have uh, lenses that allow a broader spectrum of good light in and stop the glare, you can actually go from a light situation to a dark situation and your eyes will adjust much faster. One of the technologies out there uh, that does that is called PRISM. PRISM allows you to have a lens that's very dark, uh, or dark enough, I should say, that uh, the glare of the sun won't bother you. Yet when you move from a situation Let's take, for example, riding a bike. If you move from a sunny field and you're on a trail into the dark forest again, you have a moment where you actually cannot see where you're blind. With something like Prism, that transition is seamless. You go from not squinting in the bright sun to heading into the dark areas of the forest, and you can see right through the whole transition. So at that point, you're going to see that there, there's companies out there that have uh, multi lenses so that you can actually have a dark lens for when it's really bright out. You can have a medium lens for somewhat gray and overcast days and you can have a uh, uh, what they call a low light lens and those are like uh, often clear or yellow and those things are fantastic when it's really overcast and the light levels are very low. They allow you to still see the detail out on the trail or out on the slopes wherever you are, are playing. Another neat technology uh, that's out there in glasses is polarization. Polarization is probably the most popular in the fishing world. And polarization, what that does is it stops reflected glare. Really good example of that is if you were to look at a lake. You look at a lake and sometimes you can see your own reflection in the lake. Is the lake an actual mirror? No, water's absolutely clear. So there's something happening there. And what that is, that's refracted light creating glare. When you put on a polarized glass in that scenario, it allows you to look right down into the water. That's why fishermen like it, because they can see the fish at all times into the water. Um, it also allows your eyes to relax. On that note, we're gonna go into lens quality. There is different lens qualities without a doubt. Like I mentioned previously, glass is probably one of the highest lens qualities you can get, but there are some negatives to glass lenses. 
So a lot of people that use glass lenses will use them for casual use, for fashion, for that type of thing, for their everyday reading glasses, stuff like that. Whereas for sport, you're far better to go off onto the polycarbonate train. To get a polycarbonate lens like we were talking to, a high lens quality is much more difficult than glass. So not every glass is created equal. Maybe your gas station glasses aren't quite as nice as a high-end boutique glass. And I'll explain why. Uh, when, when you cut glasses, you cut them on the X and the Y axis. The X axis and the Y axis are basically copying the curvature of your eye. If you copy the curvature of your eye, you get precision looking through the lenses. If you do it on only one of the axes, what can happen is you get distortion out of the top or the bottom, or if you're doing it on this axis, out of the sides. So if, if the lens is ground on the X and the Y axis, it allows your eye to relax much more. That's why some people find that if they wear inexpensive glasses, they find that they get sick to their stomach on a road trip. What's happening is your eye is having to compensate for the distortion in the lens, and it actually can compensate quite well. But it tires your eyes, it gives you headaches, sometimes it makes you feel sick to your stomach. So not all lenses are created equal, just like cameras. I'm looking into one right now that probably has a very high-end lens in it. Uh, the lenses and glasses, there definitely is different qualities in that. So that's another thing you're going to want to look into when you purchase glasses. Another interesting thing out there is something called the Private Pilot. Private Pilot is a company that tested all sunglasses that they could find out there. The list is very long of what they tested. And theirs is a non-biased opinion for pilots. Because pilots need high quality optics when they're flying a plane, they're up right there in the, in the sun, it's really important for them to have good quality sunglasses. This company called Private Pilot produced this list of glasses and said where they're good, where they're bad. So if you want an unbiased view on what glasses are doing well out there, what glasses are strictly fashion, and one, what glasses are actually offering technical protection, Private Pilot would be a good place to start. Thanks again for watching Gear Up.